Hello, and welcome to my very first episode of a new podcast called Capable of Change. It's going to be a recovery and healthy living and addiction-based podcast. Um, I had all kinds of ideas about what we do for this very first episode. In fact, I've recorded a couple run-throughs and they never made it to air so we're gonna see how that goes tonight Um, I am a procrastinator and I put things off like until the last minute prison really helped me with that because you know you don't have a choice and school also helped me with that but not as much as prison because you can get away with things at school not so much in prison But one of my favorite sayings is, done is better than perfect. I love that saying. I am a perfectionist as well. And I am a perfectionist in the way that it annoys my friends and my boyfriends. They always have had a problem with me wanting everything to be perfect. So I have had to learn that done is better than perfect. Sometimes just getting boots on the ground and getting things done will lead you to where you need to be and not worrying about if it's perfect or not. So that saying, it really appeals to me. So, you know, I had planned on a special premiere episode. I wanted to have a website. I wanted to address why I'm starting this podcast and what gives me the credentials to talk about drugs and recovery and healthy living and lifestyle. But you know what? All that will have to wait. Days are passing, and time is ticking, and life is just moving by at a record pace. So waiting for things to be perfect is proving to be a serious mistake. So I've just figured out that I need to get in where I fit in. Most help is needed right now on the ground like I said so I'm just going to roll with it and we can get to know each other as we go along Um, and you can find out what makes me the right person for this podcast I will say that you know I was a heroin addict for 15 years I was basically what they call a trash can junkie I would do anything you put in front of me I spent 15 years in that miserable but super fun life And I've been clean for five, and um, I'm now in school. I'm a junior working on my degree in behavioral and social studies. So I work with addicts in the community, and of course I have lots of friends still struggling with the disease. Um, I'm not gonna get into whether or not it is a disease by my definition. We'll just say that I have a lot of friends still struggling with it, and we'll deal with that later. So, like I said, this is a podcast about addiction and recovery. It's about prison reform. It's about domestic violence. It's about being a snitch or doing your time, whichever you choose. It's about both. It's about mental illness and second chances. It's about being accountable for your actions. And it's really about learning to be happy again. I always say that, you know, when I was an addict, I really didn't care if I died I knew the consequences could be death, but my life was so miserable that I didn't really care. And um, now I am super happy and I want to live every day. I wake up looking for new ways to live and figuring out ways to try to live longer and repair some of the damage I did. So, you know, that's kind of a tie in about what I wanna talk to today. Today, this podcast is going to be about what everybody else in the world is thinking about and talking about and what you can't get away from, and that is something you can't escape right now, the coronavirus and COVID-19. You know, um, if you're not aware, coronavirus is what they call the virus that causes symptoms, respiratory symptoms. Um, and it is making people sick with COVID-19. People are being quarantined. 
people are having to stay home, people are dying, people are losing their jobs. We are quarantining and sheltering in place where there is people that are not having gainful employment, they are grappling with not having money, they are grappling with the change to their schedule, they are dealing with the unexpected, they are being at home, stuck at home with people they don't like, they are in the middle of lives, they are in the middle of domestic violence type relationships and they are just having to deal with them every day, especially addicts. Um, you know, their lives are tumultuous to begin with. Every moment is a struggle and just to add this on top of it is, it's, you know, it's detrimental. Normal people out in the world right now are really struggling with the mental health and, you know, what ways to deal with what's going on in the world. Um, addicts that I know, they are struggling in their own way as well, but I have noticed that a lot of them are flourishing because um, the lifestyle of an addict is fast paced. It deals with unexpected shit that just gets thrown in their in their way. They're cavalier, addicts are cavalier and very capable. So a lot of them I have noticed that I deal with on a day to day basis, you know, they haven't missed a beat. They are still getting high. They are still doing what they did every day to survive before. They um, are doing what needs to be done. Um, but there are other ones that, you know, have had a shock to their life. They are not able to get the money that they were able to get before this all happened. Um, I know that when I was using drugs, I supported myself through selling drugs and boosting I had a ton of scams that I was involved with. One of them was boosting. I would go to stores, steal stuff from the stores, return it, get gift cards or cash, um, or sell the stuff online. You know, I would do it every day, and I would make tons of money this way. Um, well, without stores open, you can't do that. Um, I had friends that were prostitutes. That is even being cut back. You know, people don't want to have sex with strangers if they're worried they're going to get some deadly virus. I mean, you know, herpes, HIV, those things can be dealt with with protection of such, whereas, uh, you know, six feet away is pretty tough. Um to deal with in a situation like this. So I have found that a lot of addicts are having problems getting their money um, in order to continue using their drugs. Um, I know that, you know, IV drug users and viruses tend to go hand in hand. So it's always been my belief that if a pandemic or some sort of world virus as is like, I was always saying maybe a zombie apocalypse. If something like that happened, the junkies would be the first to know it. They deal with blood and close quarters and um, unsanitary conditions on a, you know, on a daily basis. So they would be the first to know it. And in this case, it's not, not very different, you know. It's very dangerous for IV drug users and just people addicted to substances in all manners right now. Um, you know, I know that when I was using, the drug dealers kept all their drugs in their mouth. Um, that's why they kept their drugs, so they could eat them if they got pulled over by the cops, if they got hassled with by the police. And this virus is passed by 
droplets from the mouth and the body. So, you know, some people share straws when they're snorting drugs. I mean, hell, people share needles. But um, I know that in the past five years since I haven't been using, I've been working with harm reduction and it have noticed that it is easier to get things like clean straws, clean needles in the community more so than what it used to be. So that is good and things have progressed in that manner. But um, it's hard. It's hard out there right now for drug addicts and people in recovery especially. Um, They're having trouble right now getting their MAT drugs, medication, uh, medication like Suboxone, Subutex, Methadone, um, you know, they're, they're harder to get. Some clinics have closed and are giving takeouts, but Methadone clinics, but when that happens, generally addicts that, most addicts are pretty bad at rationing their drug intake, so they end up taking up all their their rations and before the time, or they sell it, and they have a period of sickness that they have to go through. Go through, and it, I mean, it's happening. A lot of people I know they're on a forced detox and they're using things like plant medicine, kratom, marijuana, pretty much anything they can get their hands on. They're, you know, having to shelter in place. They're not able to get their drugs. They're not able to see their doctors. And, you know, I'm not saying that all people are having, I'm not all, I'm not saying that all people are not able to get their drugs. What I'm saying is, or let's say when I mean drugs, I mean prescribed by a doctor, um, maintenance drugs. What I am saying is that this has made it harder. It has made it harder. You know, it was people get on a routine. They go see their doctor once a month. They go see their doctor once a week. Um, they go to a pain clinic once a week. They go to a methadone clinic once a day, whatever. They're on a routine, you know years pass everything stays the same something like this happens that routine gets shaken up you know it may go two weeks where you're not able to see your doctor and every day is a struggle especially for somebody that's been clean for 10 years five years three years whatever they don't have any connects and thank god because i mean they might would have to go get something if they did because they're sick like you know, withdrawal for opiates is no joke. Um, so, you know, we all know that, and um, it's it's a struggle for them. You know, what do we do with people in active addiction during this time? I have several friends in active addiction. They are sheltering at home with their loved ones, and loved ones I know are footing the bill right now for their addicts that they love because they don't want them to bring home a virus, be put in a risky situation. So they're either paying for that person's drugs so that they can, you know, be at home and have some semblance of a normal life, or they've pushed those people out on the street and told them not to show up at their doorstep because they're scared of their lifestyle and what they may bring home. Um, a lot of addicts are living in hotels. I have a friend that's a recovering addict right now. He's new into recovery, and he's living in a hotel. And he said that, you know, we're in North Carolina. So he said, so our cases of COVID-19 are somewhere around, I think there's maybe like 900 cases in the state right now, something like that. Um, in our county, we're in, um, we're in the capital, so in our county, Wake County, I think they said there was something around um, 800 cases. I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up. Um, 
think it was like 800 in the county. I can't remember how many were in the state. But um, our outbreaks haven't been that that bad and to the point to where they're thinking about opening up the state back up to non-essential workers. But I mean, today they have just released information on the prison systems in North Carolina, um, which are out of control with COVID-19 cases. You know, um, prisons and jails are taking less inmates in there. I have a friend that works for the police um, in Chatham County. And she said that since this has happened, this was sometime last week, so, you know, maybe two months of no tickets. They had not given out a single ticket, traffic ticket. Um, the police, they were not trying to deal with it. So a lot of prisons and jails are, you know, they are, which is great for drug addicts, you know, they're less worried about being caught. That's your arch enemy is the police. But, I mean, now their arch enemy, number one, is the coronavirus, and rightly so. I know that the rehab that I work at has shut down. They're not taking any more cases. They used to be the county's homeless shelter, pretty much. If you showed up saying you didn't have a place to sleep for the night and you had a drug problem, they would take you in. And they haven't done that. They've they quit. That's it's been two months, and they've quit taking anybody. So. I have a friend also, she was clean for about a year and she relapsed several months ago and she's to the point now where she wants to go to detox but nobody will take her. They're not taking new patients right now so, you know, wherever you are at in your life, you're stuck there and if you are an addict before all this crap went down, you're stuck there whether you want to get clean or not. Um, like I said, in the prisons right now, they just had a big article about Noose Correctional Facility, which is in Goldsboro, North Carolina, which is where I grew up, where I developed my heroin habit, where I did all my teenage and early, early 20s. And um, they have uh, 450 cases and two dead right now they're reporting at news correctional facility and at nccaw which is um, north carolina's women women's prison in raleigh um, i was also there for six months and um, they are reporting 90 cases um, so there's 620 cases that have been confirmed in the entire North Carolina prison system, and that's out of nine prisons, nine prisons that have tested positive for someone, someone tested positive in their care for COVID-19. So um, that is a serious problem, and the ACLU has brought a court case against the North Carolina prison system just today, um, and basically it said that they would force the prison system to have a plan. Like um, in the Charlotte Observer today, this article says that inmates have complained that little has been done to spread the to curb the spread of coronavirus, so a judge has ordered public officials to turn over detailed information laying out what they are doing to prevent outbreaks in state prisons. So, I mean, it only, all, all it's doing is requiring them to have a plan, which they should have already had a plan to begin with. So there was 460 inmates have tested positive in news correctional facility, and two have died. And at NCCIW, 90 in inmates have been diagnosed with COVID-19. 
like I was saying earlier. So the judge's orders gives the state prisons until Friday, May 8th to provide information on whether each prison provides face masks for inmates and it's quote, that they must be of the same type and quality of those provided to the staff. They must be, um, they must have information on whether the prison provides more than one face mask per person unrestricted access to sanitation supplies, including hand soap and hand sanitizer. And I will tell you that when I was in prison, um, women were making their own tampons. They couldn't even get basic sanitary napkins. So for anybody to think that they, they, you couldn't get hand sanitizer because people would drink it. So, I mean, I, I can't imagine that people, are having unrestricted sanitation, unrestricted access to sanitation supplies in prison. Um, they also need to tell whether the living conditions are de designed to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Specifically, the order says the state should provide information about whether each prison has reassigned bunks to allow for six feet or more between occupants. I will say that when I was in prison, um, your bunk mate, of course, is underneath you, so that's about two foot away, all up in your space. Um, and then the bunks beside you are about three feet away. It is almost impossible to have your own space in there. Um, that's in prison. In jails, it is even worse. People are sleeping on the floor. They're in mats on the floor. They are all in housed in one area. It, I just, I mean, I, I know right now in jails that they, I have my ex-boyfriend is currently in the Wake County Detention Center. He was locked up February 2nd, I believe. And we're in May, May, May 3rd now. So he, um, he was locked up in, in February. And I know that he said that they have been on 23 and a half hour lockdown, not able to come out of their cells. They get fed through the door in their cell. They do not come out for rec. They do not have um, visitation. They're not allowed to have visitation. Um, they have access to a phone. It is not cleaned. It is hard to hear on. People yell and spit into the receiver, and they have been told, you know, using the phone is pretty much like risking your life in there. So, um, so to think that any of these guidelines are happening in a prison or jail, it's, I mean, I don't, it's not possible. And, this mandate only says that the judge has the judge has to hear information about whether the prison are is doing these things so i mean when they get the information and they say that they're not doing these things like what happens then you know all their all this order is making them do is report which is good you know any help is good uh, if you're helping it's it, that's great you know anything is better than nothing but I mean we can't continue to keep people locked up on things like my ex he's locked up on a trafficking charge right now he was trafficking heroin he's been a heroin addict for 20 years he's always struggled with drugs he's a good person he's just a heroin addict so I mean he shouldn't have to die over it he shouldn't have to catch COVID-19 and die because he's being held in a place where they're not doing enough to curb the spread of it. I mean, he is not eligible to be released. They are supposed to be releasing people. I am not advocating for releasing criminals back into the, into the population before they're ready, but I mean, if you have a felony at all, you can't be 
you're not eligible to be released. So, I mean, that's out. You know, anybody, most people that are looking at any time are looking at it for felonies. Nobody's really locked up in a prison over a misdemeanor. So, um, you know, like, I don't know. The, the article goes on to say that inmates are complaining that they have lack of access to disinfectant inside the dorms and of course that phones are rarely disinfected between uses i mean some people have died they are reporting that there has been deaths already and i mean i would say that while i was in prison the health care at nccaw where i was specifically is horrible. People in there were dying over things that could have been prevented all the time because the prison system rarely lets people go to the hospital. They have a hospital or critical area inside their prison and if you need dental, if you have a toothache or something, it could take months before you could actually see a doctor outside of prison grounds. If it's even bad enough to where, you know, if you were diagnosed, if something happened and you woke up and you had a big lump in your breast and you were concerned you had breast cancer, it would, it could literally be, First of all, you have to pay to see a doctor. And if you don't have any money, then you're done. I mean, that, that's it. You're not going to, you have to pay to put in a medicine call. So, you know, there's that. Um, but secondly, by the time you do see a doctor, whatever's wrong with you could have progressed so much to the point to where, you, you know, you can literally die. I know several people that almost died in prison because... They just didn't get the help they needed in time because, you know, in prison things move so very slow. It's just, you know, it's just so slow moving in there. It takes so long to get anything done. And like I said, they have suspended visitation. Um, so it's hard for family members to find out what's going on with their loved ones. Um, they're on 23 and a half hour lockdown. They have one or two phones per, per dorm. So this is in the jails. So it's hard to talk to, to get access to use the phone in there. So it's hard to find out what's going on. Um, so, you know, like, the states are just not doing what this state is not doing what it needs to do to handle people that are locked up which are the responsibility of the state right now i do not claim to know what they need to do it is a big freaking mess so you know i, I don't know what they need to do but what they are doing right now is not enough you know i have a friend she is calling this the Great Pause. And she thinks it's, um, it's a time to take a step back and work on yourself. It's a time to try something new, to get out of your comfort zone. You know, um, it's a time to, to concentrate on change. Well, I had a friend, she recently came to me because she was having a hard time getting off her Xanax. You know, she was being put on forced withdrawal. So she asked me if I had any tips. And you know, um, I was also on Xanax, Clonopin, um, a ton of benzos for about 15 years. So I have learned a lot of ways to deal with it. Um, so you know, I talked to her about the benefits of meditation, which we will get into at some point um, and I talked to her about 
plant medicine. I am a huge advocate of plant medicine. Um, some of the plant medicines that look, I'm, I'm going to be a hundred percent honest when you're looking at something like a lifelong addiction to Xanax in comparison to a lifelong addiction to marijuana, I would take the latter any day, even though marijuana is not legal. I mean, I'm going to be the first to say I'm not a fan of benzos. I was on Clonopan and Xanax for 20 years, and now I have been off of all pharmaceuticals for about seven years now, um, except, you know, Suboxone, of course. Um, and now I am way more adjusted now than I ever was before. I mean, it definitely is my belief that benzos actually make anxiety worse. I mean, it ramps them up. And then when you can't get your benzos, whatever, they're at home in the car or, you know, you're upstairs at work and they're downstairs in your locker or you can't get your doctor or just whatever, they run out of your system that's when anxiety really kicks in. So I'm really into using holistic techniques like meditation and herbs primarily before turning to, ph to pharmaceuticals. Um, specifically, meditation has changed my life. I tell all my friends, and just like I told this particular person, that um, I have my own mantra um, but my boyfriend uses the Ho Sum Mantra, which is a very easy meditation to get started with. If you're starting out, um, you say Ho Sum, and I would try maybe 10 minutes a day while focusing on your breathing. You say Ho, ho while you're breathing out and some while you're breathing in. So ho, some, in, out, in, out. So you repeat this um, for 10 to 15 minutes every day. I like to start my day with it in the morning before I even get out of bed. I start meditating. I set a timer, um, 10 to 15 minutes, I meditate. If your mind starts wandering, then you just start again when you realize it. Um, and you just work to do this for 10 to 15 minutes a day. And I promise you'll see a difference in your anxiety levels. You do this as opposed to getting on something like Xanax or Clonopin. You also do this to get off of something like Xanax or Clonopin. You also do this when you're going through any type of withdrawal. And if you're not going through any type of withdrawal, if you're just trying to be a better person, meditation's great for that as well. I personally discovered meditation in prison through um, the prison, oh, I can't remember what it was, um, but it's a program that teaches people how to meditate pretty much and exposes people to different types of religion. I'll find out about it more and um, we'll get back and I'll t tell you more about it. But um, Also, I, I would like to say that while we're talking about anxiety, I also re recommended to my friend a natural herb called the macuna bean or the velvet bean, if you want to look it up. It is also called L-Dopa, L.D-O-P-A, and it is a precursor to dopamine. So as addicts, we have really just burned out our light bulbs when it comes to dopamine. Our bodies have, you know, we've been on a trigger. Every time we use a drug, it opens up. It floods our receptors with dopamine. I like to say it's kind of like a light bulb where, you know, you have burned your light bulbs so hot, you have flipped on that switch off and on, off and on, off and on like a five-year-old. And at this point in your life, after 10 or 15 years of usage, your light bulb just doesn't burn anymore. It's totally burnt out. 
and that's what's happened. It is hard to get addicts excited about normal things like the sunrise or, you know, nature because we've we've just chemically destroyed our dopamine receptors. So this natural supplement that you can buy in any health food store or online um, called L-Dopa or if you want to look it up the Macuna bean M-U-C-U-N-A or the velvet bean um, it has been used for thousands and thousands of years as a way to create more dopamine in your body and a way to level off your anxiety and your panic attacks and I recommend it to everybody anybody that asks me about anxiety you can put it in smoothies or coffee in the morning and it works better than any benzo I've ever had with no bad side effects it's 100% natural and um, it's something that should be in your toolbox when it comes to recovery it helps restore your body to the natural levels of dopamine. I personally am super into plant medicines and supplements and helping teach your body tricks to deal with life. And that's one that I've used, you know. Um, I'm also a huge proponent of marijuana. In my opinion, I believe marijuana... You know, I believe that we use the word drugs as just like a blanket, whereas some drugs are good and some drugs are bad, you know, so marijuana is a good drug in my opinion. It is also something that you need in your toolbox. Um, and if you live in a state where it's legal, it's good for you, you know. Um, North Carolina, we're not, we're not there yet, but I... I wrote a paper in college called The Answer to Drugs is More Drugs because I personally believe that things like plant medicine and Suboxone and Vivitrol and things like that are positive drugs that can help people get off of drugs. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You're already addicted to heroin or cocaine or What's the worst that can happen? You know, telling these people not to do marijuana, whatever. If somebody came to you tomorrow and said that all the addicts would be healed of their heroin addiction if they were able to smoke marijuana, who would not take that trade? Who in their right mind would not take that trade? But, um, you know, I just... I'm not going to get into my soapbox today about marijuana. I'm going to save that for another day. You know, we're still talking about COVID-19. Um, and COVID-19, it has been reported that smoking is not good. You want to have cilia in your lungs. Smoking burns up your cilia. So it's better to be using things like edibles right now. Um, if you can get access to it. But, um, like I said about my friend, going back to her calling it the Great Pause, it is a time when you should be working on yourself. You should be working on your projects that you've had piling up in the corner for years, saying, I'm going to get to that. This is the time to get to that. And we all should be working on those things, and we definitely should be working on ourselves, especially if we're in recovery. We should look at something like, you know, this as a time to shake it up and deal with things and, you know, try something new. Try meditation. Try plant medicines. Try things. Open your mind a little bit. Um... You know, I'm not going to advocate for hallucinogens, but um, there's a lot of good research on them. I'm not going to advocate for them right now. Um, there's a lot of good research on it. But, um, you know, 
if you're feeling a little blue, try some plant medicines. You know, nature makes all kinds of wonderful and legal plants, and it's available to everyone. Also, try meditation. Like I said, it's a great time to try that. In fact, there is a study, it is called the Maharishi Effect, and it's about mass meditation. So the Maharishi Effect is, um, in 1960, a yogi predicted that 1% of the population practicing the transcendental technique of meditation would produce measurable improvements in the quality of life for the whole population. So this document, this phenomenon was first documented in scientific research, research in 1976, before I was born, when it was found that 1% of the community practiced meditation and the crime rate was reduced by 16% on average. So they named the phenomenon the Maharishi effect. And since then, People have been studying and studying and studying. Right now, nine peer-reviewed articles comprising 14 studies have now been published to support this effect, this hypothesized effect. Um, basically, in, from the period of 2007 to 2010, they had these people go around and meditate they would go from city to city like you know maybe they put somebody in Toledo Ohio they put somebody in Raleigh North Carolina they put somebody in Kansas City Missouri like whatever they put somebody in all these places and then they measured the baseline reduction of violent crime um and they found a decrease in both national homicide rate or for the ta for that town they found a release uh, a decrease in homicide rate and violent crime rate compared to just the normal amount of reduction um, with nothing in cities where there was no meditation and then recently they did a another study where so I guess you need to have 1% of the population meditating at one point specific time in order to see this decrease so they had been previously just doing it in these small groups like I said like you know where one pe where one percent of the population would be sent to a specific area such as Toledo Ohio they sent one percent of that population those people would go in they'd meditate for a month at the same time and then they'd measure the decrease in crime rates um, and that's how they had been doing their studies but in 2007 they had a group of people get together that was big enough to be 1% of the nation's population. I don't have the numbers in front of me right now to say how many people that was, but they were able to prove that the national homicide rate and urban violent crime rate decreased Let's see, relative to the base light period, the drop in homicide rate was 21.2% and 18.5% for violent crime. Just by having 1% of the population all meditating at one time. So that started in July in 2006 and they it took that long to create a group large enough to have influence on the US as a whole. So, um, oh, it, the required size was 1,725 participants, the square root of 1% of the U.S. population at the time. And um, they were able to make this happen. So, I mean, I don't see why that's not something that should be 
taken more seriously. But I do know that if you are interested in um, meditating, there are some groups, or in getting into something like this, there are some groups that are doing mass meditation. Um, and you can find them on YouTube. I personally like Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. He um, has a global meditation that he does every day. I believe it's like at 7 o'clock every day where everybody gets together and meditate to try to stop COVID-19 pretty much. Um, also Deepak Chopra. He has a channel called The Chopra Well, and he puts out a daily mass meditation as well as a morning meditation. So if you're to the point to where you're wanting to get into meditation, but you don't really know how to do it, you can go check out his channel, and there's like a 10 or 15 morning med meditation you can do every day. So, um, you know, that's just one of the things you can do is participate in something like this to help you get into a schedule of meditation and a schedule of healing your body because the only thing you have right now to help you combat this virus is your health and you know I think it's something like it's said that the human body changes every five years your cells have turned over and you are a completely new human being. So for me, five years ago, I was sticking needles in my arms and any other vein I could find. Um, I was, no, I lived in filth. I was not healthy. I sat on the couch for hours a day, nodded out. I smoked. I drank a pint of liquor, half gallon of liquor every day. I was just super not healthy. Um, my face was really puffy and you know, I had open sores from needles. So it is amazing that today my doctor says you could never tell it. And today I am a vegetarian. I am super focused into health and exercise and nature and being healthy. So, I mean, you can make this change. You just have to, just like I said earlier, boots on the ground. You have to just start. Start where you are. Just start right now. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it done. Just start today. Start a little bit. A little bit every day and eventually you know you'll get to to the place you want to be you'll get to be happy again which is you know something that addicts rarely feel and it can be done you know I always was one to say that I wasn't ashamed of getting high I really liked my life I liked getting high it was fun to me it was also something I excelled at I was good at it I was good at selling drugs I was good at getting drugs I was good at navigating the drug scene I had built up a reputation for myself that I didn't take any shit so you know I was a badass and I liked that but I wasn't happy and I always knew that I would one day get tired of struggling and I wasn't going to fool myself when people, when I'd get locked up, they'd say, okay, are you going to stop this time? And I'd be like, no, I'm probably not because I wasn't ready. But one day, one day I was, and one day I got tired of struggling and I just wanted just a little bit more for my life. It was like, I didn't even really want just a little bit more. I just wanted to see what was on the other side. I was just curious. So I am here today and I, it was just because of that little bit of curiosity. And so I promise it's possible. Anyone can do it and anyone can make that change. We are all capable of change and that's why I named my podcast Capable of Change. I definitely believe that you are capable of change just like I was. So until next time, just keep fighting 
keep searching, keep trying. And um, next time we'll get together and talk about something else. Until then, I will be signing off.